Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. This morning I thought we would take a look at a little bit of ornamental ironwork. What I thought we would do is take these four pieces of half inch square bar, they're about 16 inches long. So that's 13 millimeter square bar, about 400 millimeters long. Four identical pieces and I think I'm going to assemble these into a frame using half lap joints. We've looked at half lap joints before and I'll link to that video up here. But this will be a review of that process and when we're done we'll have a little square frame about 12 inches on the inside that we can use for something else. And I have an idea of what I want to do with this. It's going to be kind of an ongoing project. But the frame itself can be used for a lot of different things. So this is a standalone thing. And then we will add some ornamental elements into it. Some sort of sea scrolls with hot collars, things like that. And make something that is just an ornamental piece to hang on the wall. You could use it as a frame for a mirror or a picture or something like that without this the fill work into it. Or it would make a nice little security element for a front door with a small window in it. But if you're doing that, make it fit the window. This is just an arbitrary size I chose because I don't have a final use for it. So the first thing I want to do is go over to the forge and I want to knock the corners off of this and take the sharp factory corners off. I don't think it looks very good. So I like just beveling the corners a little bit. Then we'll get into the layout and making the half lap joints. Now one of the reasons I like working in a gas forge is that I can bring all four bars up to heat and texture them quite quickly. I don't have to worry about the bars and the fire overheating and burning like you might in a coal forge. And this is much more efficient. Most of this from one end and straighten it, turn it around, and then we'll do that last little bit that I was holding on to with the tongs. Now if you like the look of the raw factory edge on your material, you can omit this step. But personally, I think that looks a little bit too sterile, a little bit too mass produced, even though I'm going to forge all the joinery. I just like to take some of that sharp, crisp corner off and give it just a little bit of texture. Nothing too dramatic or too gratuitous. Our bars have cooled, so now it's time to lay out where I want to put the joints. I'm going to cross these kind of like this, so there's going to be about an inch and a half above and to the side of each one of these. Ultimately, I, we'll upset the ends of these just to give that a little bit more character. So I'm going to come in an inch and a half from each end of the bar. So that's something like 38 millimeters in from each end of the bar. Again, there's nothing special about these measurements. This is just kind of a practice piece or a test piece. I'm not going to go anywhere special. So it's just all arbitrary measurements made up right here on the spot. So the simple mark there, now I'm going to come back, I'm going to center punch mark these. If you have a square pointed center punch, it will be easier to find this when they're hot in the fire. So we just want to put a nice center punch mark on each of these. Now when it comes time to forge the actual half lap joint, the center punch marks will come together, so you just have to be good at lining those up, and that's how we'll line these up to forge the joint. With our joints laid out, it's time to go ahead and forge the half lap joints. When we do this, we're going to put one bar on top of the other, both hot, and we're going to forge them together so that each joint is custom fit to itself. 
That means we have to keep it straight which joint goes where in the finished project. Now you can go through and mark these with letter stamps, mark 1A and 1B, make sure you do it from what will be the back side of each piece when you do that, otherwise it's going to look bad on the front. You could use a series of center punch marks. I'm just going to lay this out and pick up one pair of bars at a time and then put them back when I'm done right in the same location so that I remember where they go. So I'm going to go ahead and start with these two bars and I'll get these ends hot. I'll come back and put them back on the swedge block then I'll go to these two bars. And yes, I'll have to hold them in tongs. You don't want to pick them up hot. Now, I don't generally do these at the anvil. You can see that one's already cooling down as I mess with this. But it can be done. I'm going to go ahead and heat that back up and I'll put this one on the bottom the next time. This does make it a little more confusing and you're more likely to get these out of order when you go back to the main piece. But since these are the first two, it doesn't throw anything else off. And it's nice to use a flatter on these to make sure it's good and smooth on the top. A striker would come in very handy. There's our half lap joint. That's all you need to, to do. We'll need to put a hole in it at some point. And we could go ahead and punch this at the anvil or we could use a drill press. I think I'm going to go ahead and drill these just to make sure everything lines up just right. So these were here initially. Like I say, then I want to take this one and it goes to my left hand now. And this bar. And this is the top bar in this joint. So I need to do them this way. And if you have a fly press, you can do these under the fly press. But again, it's a job that uh, would like to have more than one set of hands. So if you have an apprentice in the shop, it would be a little bit easier. And they cool down quite quickly as you're lining them up. So that's that's a problem with both doing it by hand at the anvil and doing it at the fly press. So let's get those hot again. pretty good. I think I'll turn them over and that'll flatten this one piece down a little bit. If you've got a power hammer with flat dies, that'll work as long as you have enough control that you don't just demolish the piece while you're forging it. My preferred method is to do this under the treadle hammer. It's another foot operated tool so I don't have to let go of either of the pieces I'm working on and it's very controllable. It's just how hard do you stomp on the treadle is how hard this is going to hit. So you can be very precise. It's got nice big flat dies in it. I think this is the ideal tool for the job if you have it, but if you don't there's lots of other ways to do it. You could even do it under a hydraulic press, but that seems like radical overkill in my book. And as always, try to get the center punch marks lined up so everything's symmetrical. That's all there is to it. I'm just going to set these back in position 
I'm not gonna try and tuck them all in. They'll fall off the block as I mess with it and I still need to move them. But we know that we got all the joints going the right direction. You say this one needs to tuck under. But the next step is to do the little upsets on the end that I had mentioned earlier. So I'm gonna take one bar at a time. And I'm gonna use the torch to heat just the end and upset it in the vise. Now this is just a decorative upset. It doesn't serve any functional purpose other than to provide a finished end to the bar. You could draw it out, you could forge some sort of a spade finial, you could split the end of the bar and scroll it. Lots of different things you could do with this. I just kind of like the upset on this kind of a piece. Now because I envision the finished piece as perhaps being a wall hanging, I want to make sure all of the upsets go to the front of the bar. And if you need to, you can straighten it up on the anvil. That's all it really needs though. And I'm not going to show doing that to all eight ends. It looks the same eight times over. So if you want to see all eight of them, just rewind this eight times and watch that over again. To help keep things straight, I went ahead and marked these, but I marked them with a soapstone. Something that if I marked each end and numbered them, I would have obliterated while I was doing the forging. I used a cabinet maker's trip or a cabinet maker's triangle. By drawing triangles that always point up, you know that these two are the side pieces. And these two, well those triangles don't match, but if you put them like this, the triangle always points up. There's the bottom, there's the top, and that way you can always keep it straight. Now, now for heavy forging this is going to rub off and I don't really want to chisel it in, although I guess you could if, as long as you made sure it was on the back. This is actually on the front and I'll just wipe it off after I drill the holes and rivet these together. Which, by the way, is the next step. So because I can le just leave this up here nice and supported, I'll just go ahead and do this on the table. It's a little noisier, so you might want to turn the volume down just a little. Take a moment to knock the little burrs off on the inside there. That'll make everything go smoother in the long run. Now to mark this, I will use a transfer punch. These come in all the same sizes as your drill bits. And you just take one the same size as the hole you just drilled. And mark through the, the hole. Then drill your holes. And on these, I'm going to more deeply countersink the back so that I can have a countersunk rivet on the back. Just knock any burrs off the inside. And with that, it's time to put some rivets in. I've drilled this for quarter inch rivets. We're going to need a rivet about three quarters of an inch long to go through the half inch thickness and still have enough to make a countersunk head. It's a good idea to snug it up with a monkey tool if you have one. Typically I set 3 16 rivets cold and anything smaller than that cold. Anything larger than quarter inch I do hot. Quarter inch I kind of flip a coin and see what I feel like that day. Let's see how these do cold. Make sure it stays in the rivet header. If it bounces out like that and you hit it again, you might end up putting a little lip on there and you don't want that. But that's a good solid rivet. That's not going anywhere. And of course we'll repeat the same steps with the opposite corner.
And then we'll put the two halves together. And then we can finish assembling this. If you're doing a frame much bigger than this, you might want a work stand to set it on. Now odds are this is going to be a little bit out of square and we'll deal with that before we're all done with the project. But that's a good tight frame. Actually it doesn't look as far out of square as I thought it might. So that's all we're going to do today. And we will then pick this project up maybe next week, maybe the week after, and we'll do some sort of an ornamental fill on this. And at that time, we'll make any tweaks and adjustments we need to to make the frame straight. Now, you can make any size frame you want. You can make a window grill using this technique. It just needs to be upscaled to fit. And this is just one method for making a frame using traditional techniques. You can certainly forge weld it. There are lots of other ways that you can do this. And we'll look at some of those other techniques in future videos. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. But then by all means, make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.